and let us pray. Father, again, we come before you and we thank you for your word, your, your truth. Your word is truth, Lord. And your word does heal. Your word does guide and direct us. And your word is life. Oh, Lord, that we would follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, during World War II, Richard Wormbrand lived in Romania. And in August of 1944, a million Russians poured into Romania, mostly soldiers, to rid that country of the Nazi regime. Well, the country soon became communist. And for Richard, he loved the Russian people, and he delighted in preaching the gospel to them. And communism, as you may know, is a very dangerous and destructive form of government, especially to preachers and the Christian church. And Richard was a Lutheran pastor. Well, an Orthodox priest had phoned Richard and told him that a Russian officer had come to him and confessed, confessed Christ or confessed his sins. And since this priest didn't know uh, Russian and he knew Richard did, he says, maybe you can help him. And so uh, the next day, this Russian officer came to see Pastor Wormbrand. And this Russian officer longed for God, but he had never seen a Bible. He had had no religious education, and he had never attended any religious services. Well, Richard read to him the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, and the parables of Jesus. And after hearing them, this Russian officer danced around the room. And, and with, he was so happy and so full of joy. He says, what a wonderful beauty, he said. How could I live without knowing Christ? And, and Pastor Wurmbrand was just amazed at how joyful he was. Well, then Richard made a mistake. He read to him the passion and the crucifixion of Christ without really preparing him for it. And so he had not expected it. When he heard how Christ was beaten, he was crucified, and in the end he died, he fell into an armchair and he began to weep bitterly. And he says, oh, I believe in this Savior. Now he's dead. He's dead. And he was truly sad and deflated. His Savior was dead. And he looked like Mary Magdalene weeping at the foot of the cross and weeping when Jesus was taken to the tomb. Then Richard read to him the story of the resurrection and watched his expression change. He had not known that his Savior came back to life from the tomb. And when he heard this, he he was so happy, he began dancing again. And using very dirty profanity, he praised God. Well, this was his crude manner of speech. He really didn't know any better. And again, he rejoiced, shouting, He is alive! He is alive! Richard then said, let us pray. And of course, this man, he didn't really know how to pray, didn't know any other religious language. And this man fell on his knees and he says, he said this, oh God, what a fine chap you are. If I were you and you were me, I would never have forgiven you of your sins. But you really are a nice chap. I love you with all my heart. The amazing beauty of a person Maybe an ignorant person in matters of God coming to Christ proves the power of God's gospel. When you are weak, you're made strong. When you are not wise, you are made wise. When you are a sinner, you're made holy. When you do not love, you have love poured through you. When you are lost, Christ finds you. When you are addicted, God frees you. When you're rejected, God loves you. When you are at your lowest, God lifts you up. And when you are enslaved, God saves you. For God is our Savior. As we reflect this Christmas season, let us remember the baby in the manger who made all of the saving we need possible. Let us gaze on Christ as he carried the cross. Marvel as he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Let us weep as they pierce his hands and his feet making him a humiliating spectacle. Let us kneel in worship as he dies, knowing that the weight of sin is, that he's, that he's bearing that weight of sin. Then let us rejoice and celebrate and dance with joy like that Russian officer, knowing he has risen from the dead and walked out of that tomb, knowing that he has freed us from sin and death. Our Lord Jesus Christ, that baby in the manger who grew to be a man, made our salvation a reality. We live because he died. We have hope because he arose. And he is our Savior and he is our Lord. 
As we gaze on the baby in the manger, he was weak, simply a baby. When we look at Christ on the cross, we see that he is weak, weakened by the beatings that he took, the loss of blood and the weight of sin. But through that weakness, he made you and me strong. When you're weak, you're strong. And I want us to know today, when you are weak, you are made strong. Made strong by Christ. Made strong by him. Paul wrote about this. He notices the upside down nature of the kingdom of God. But in reality, he sees the wrong direction that sin takes you. Our eyes see what is good. And in reality, it is sin sin leading us to death. For what is in us is not good. It's sin. In 1 Corinthians, he wrote, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Humanity will never seek after Christ. And in that truth, we as people, as humanity, are led astray by the false wisdom far away from God. When we recognize we are fools, will we be made wise through Christ? For Christ is our wisdom. We are fools without Christ. Christ is our wisdom. Later on, Paul suffered from what is known as a thorn in the side of his flesh. Nobody really knows what that thorn is. A lot of people have speculated. But he prayed for this thorn, whatever it was, to be removed. Three times he prayed. And in 2 Corinthians 12, it says, "My grace." this is Christ's answer to him for this prayer. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Then Paul wrote, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. For when I am weak, then I made strong. When you are weak, you are made strong in Christ. The reality is we are weak. Whether you want to dress it up any other way and say, no, I'm not. We are weak. We are easy prey to the enemy. We are easy, we're weak to the temptations of sin. So when you realize you're weak, you will rely on Christ heavily, deeply, and devotedly. You will say, Christ, I got nothing. I'm weak. I need you. Because the minute you say I'm not weak, and you can handle all this stuff, you'll either fall, become (laughs) self-righteous, all of the above, for Christ is strong and in his strength is the strength we need. Why do we need to be saved? Is the tr- it tells us that we're weak. Because we need to be saved tells us we are weak. But we are saved because Christ is strong and in his strength is revealed all the more our weakness. And so all the more we rely on him. Seven centuries before Christ lived a, a great man of God who was king of Judah. His name was Hezekiah. It is said of him in 2 Kings that he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast to the Lord and did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. He was a faithful king. He was one of of the rare good kings, if you will. He he repaired the temple. He reminded the people of their origin. He brought them back to the word of God. He brought them back to Deuteronomy. He kept the the feasts and he reinstituted the Passover. He crushed all the idols in high places. There were different areas within the region of Judah that people would build these altars throughout called these high places on these hills and, and they would go worship there. He got rid of all of that. And he says, there's to be no idol worship. God and God alone is to be worshipped, and he's to be worshipped the way that he told us. God was his priority. Well, about 200 years before Hezekiah was king, the nation of Israel was one nation. You had one nation, and then after Solomon died, it split into two. You had the northern kingdom called Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. And in the northern kingdom, the the first king named Jeroboam decided he didn't want his people going down to Jerusalem. So he put up two idols, one in the south, one in the north. And he says, there's your gods, worship them. Well, that was truly an affront to God. He hated those idols. He sent prophet after prophet saying, rid this nation of these idols. They would not do it. No king of the northern kingdom ever removed those idols. And so finally... The strong and massive army of the Assyrians who were to the east came in 
and destroyed Samaria, the nation of Israel, sending the nation of Israel exile to, back to Assyria. They were exiled. And as the Assyrian army is approaching Israel, you got it. You got these people from the north fleeing, coming down into Jerusalem. And Hezekiah brings them in. And then he watches the Assyrians bring ruin and destruction on Israel. Israel is consumed. And as Israel is consumed, the king of Assyria says, how about Judah? We won't attack you, but you're going to have to pay a heavy tax. Well, as Hezekiah takes the throne... He decides not to pay that tax. And, of course, the king, Sennacherib is his name, says, well, we'll see about that. And so he begins to uh, very easily um, march his army toward Jerusalem. And with debilitating ease, he devours cities. He devours other areas. There's no nothing that can stop this king and his massive army. And he comes to Jerusalem. Hezekiah, in the meantime, is trying to sue for peace, takes all the money, says, here, take this money and don't hurt us. And he says, no way. And so he sends this field commander to draw up the terms of Judah's surrender. Well, Judah, in comparison to Assyria, is very weak and very and not capable of standing up to this world bully. There's nothing they humanly can do to stop what he's what this kingdom is going to do. There is no way out there. The, the, the Syria has all the power, has all the cards, has all the winning hands. There is nothing a Judah can do. There's no way out They are beyond any kind of human help. They are weak. But I'm here to tell you, God is strong. You are weak, but in Christ you are made strong. Number one, weakness gives opportunity to surrender. Let's take a look at chapter 36 of Isaiah. Start with verse 1. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Lachish, to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. When the commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the the road to the washerman's field, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, and the recorder went out to him. The field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have strategy and military strength, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look now, you're depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff which pierces a man's hand and wounds him if he leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. And if you say to me, we're depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed, saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar? Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How then can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you're depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this land without the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. To whom will you surrender? Our own weaknesses help us to understand our need and our need to depend. But to whom do you surrender is an important to note and to ask. What's interesting, this story uh, is in Isaiah 36, 37, is recorded in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. It's a very prominent story. This, too, is a story of Egypt versus Israel, like we talked about last week. It's the might and arrogance of man versus the love and beauty of God. This is man building Babel, like we read about in Genesis 11 and God having to come down. Once Pastor Wormbrand met uh, a Russian couple. They were both sculptors. And when the pastor spoke to them about God, they answered, No, God does not exist. We're godless. But we tell you something interesting that happened to us. That's what this couple said. And in the husband's own words, he said this, Once we worked on a statue of uh, Stalin, and during the work, my wife asked me, How about the thumb? If we did not have an opposing thumb, if our fingers were like our toes... We could not hold a hammer, mallet, tool, book, or a piece of bread. Human life would be impossible without this little thumb. Now, who made the thumb? 
We both learn Marxism in school and know that heaven and earth exist by themselves. They're not created by God. So I have learned and so I believe. But if God did not create heaven and earth, if he created only the thumb, he would be praiseworthy for this little thing, this thumb. We praise Edison, Bell, and Stevenson who invented the electric bulb, telephone, railway, and other things. But why should we not praise the one who has invented the thumb? If Edison had not had a thumb, he would have invented nothing. It is only right to worship the God who made the thumb. They saw God, even though they had been brainwashed with communism ideology. The might of any human ideology falls victim to the beauty of God's creation, revelation, and mystery. The God who created our thumb is worthy of praise. He is worthy. He's worthy because in his power and might, he has made himself known. He made himself known to sculptures in Russia, to factory workers in Poland, to men living in a shanty town in India, and to you and me here in America. When God reveals, he saves, he brings life. When you're weak, you're made strong. Number one, surrender to God. You know, as this field commander here in Isaiah 36 appears before the men and women of Jerusalem, he speaks with arrogance just dripping off of his lips. He stands before the officers of King Hezekiah. He mocks the city. And of course, he insults the God of Judah. For in the mind of this field commander, he has all the cards. He has the winning hands. This city cannot defend itself against him. Judah cannot depend on their military, and they certainly cannot depend on Egypt. And one of the reasons they can't depend on Egypt is that, if you notice, he was in Lachish. Lachish was a major city that was on the road from Egypt up the north, you know. And so if they took that city, then they would block Egypt from coming. And so here, even if they were to trust Egypt, Egypt, would they have the military strength to defend and help and to stop Assyria? Well, then the field commander asked if Judah could rely on their God. Certainly God cannot be relied upon. Look at the city and the nation itself. It was insignificant in this city. What God would want to save this people in this city? Didn't Hezekiah remove all the high places? And that is why God is letting them be destroyed? No, Hezekiah was supposed to remove those high places. Obviously, this man did not know the true and living God. So God will make himself known. This man then offers horses and chariots. But of course, you don't have enough men to put to use them. You know what? As this field commander went in for the kill, he says, God then told me to come in and destroy this place. You don't know me very well, I imagine God was saying. Maybe it's time you do. You know, as the world taunts us and the skepticism of this age hounds our knowledge of God, we surrender not to the voices of this world, but to God. The mocking of this field commander gives rise for the people of Judah to simply surrender to their God and not to the voices of fallible men. In the war we rage with the enemy's voices screaming at us to give up, we stand firm in the conviction of God's word and the truth of Christ and his gospel. When you surrender to God, the world cannot own you. But you have to realize you're weak so that you will rely on him. Because I guarantee you the skepticism of this age will pull you away. For when you're weak, you're made strong. We may look like this a befuddled and weakened city of Jerusalem to this world. We stand next to the cross, our crucified God. The world looks at who we are and does not see the risen Savior. The mocking of the evil age will resonate but become silent when we surrender rightfully to our God. The arrogance of man may get the upper hand from time to time, but it will never get the final say. For our God reigns. Our God is our Savior. And we can depend on him. Number two, when you're weak, run to God. 
Let's continue with verse 11. 36. Then Eliakim, Shabna, and Joah said to the field commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, since we understand it. Do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the commander replied, Was it only to your master and you, and you that my master sent me to say these things and not to the men sitting on the wall? Who, like you, will have to eat their own filth and drink their own urine? Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Well, this is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hands of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from his own vine and fig tree and drink water from his own cistern. Until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Seth Arvain? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who are Who of all the gods of these countries have been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Famous last words. But the Lord, but the people remained silent and said nothing in reply because the king had commanded, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him what the field commander had said. When King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. The taunting of this field commander who was a member of Sennacherib's joint chief of staff, if you will. He knew no bounds. For the most part, what he is promising is a lie. He has no intention offering anything good to these people, for those that tend to, to want to defect and come to his side. He will not give them a vine and a fig tree. He will not let them have any kind of freedom. They will be exiled. They will be oppressed. They will probably be enslaved or even die. He has no intentions of giving them horses or chariots. He has no intention of helping Jerusalem in any way. He simply will destroy this city as he's destroyed countless others, and the people will suffer the consequences, whether they defect or they stay. Well, if you were sitting on the wall and as, these field com- as this field commander was saying these things, as you saw the vast army behind him and you saw the, the chariots and you saw the horsemen and you saw the weaponry, it would have been a frightening sight. This was the end. There was no tomorrow. It was a very frightening sight. And, and you, then you look and you turn around and you look at your own army and you go, we don't stand a chance. Your your army was pitiful and their army was mighty. This was a superpower. We were just a city. There is no way for Jerusalem ever to succeed on their on their own. So number one, recognize your limitations. You know, the field commander would have never thought of limitations. The Assyrian army never would have stood back and thought. Uh, We have limitations. They would have never thought that. They would have never uh, entertained that thought. They would have only thought of the superiority of their fighting forces, of the wealth that they had and the victories that they continued to have. He did not care about the gods of those he fought. Every town and city and state had gods. Who cared about those gods? Our gods in Assyria are stronger, obviously, since we've defeated all these cities and these gods. Why would Jerusalem be anything different? How could their God be strong since their city is so weak and their army so small? Well, the field commander taunted the living God. Look at verse 18 again. It says, do not let Hezekiah mislead you when he says the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his his, his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Has any other God... How can then this, the, the Lord, the, your God, deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Imagine again God saying, well, you don't know me very well. Maybe it's time you do. See, Jerusalem saw their limitations. It was painfully exposed to them by what the field commander was saying. The field commander did not see any limitations, but he forgot. God is in control. 
As God would humble Pharaoh of Egypt, he would humble Assyria. As he humbled Nebuchadnezzar, he would humble Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. Nebuchadnezzar would actually write about God in chapter 4 of Daniel. He says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just, and those who walk in his in pride he is able to humble. <laughs> and in Proverbs we read, He mocks the proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. Pride will not let you see your limitations. Pride is actually a calling to expand your own selfishness and to gain more power for yourself and say, look at me. This failed commander got the attention of God as the arrogance was dripping from his lips. How can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? It's like the engineers and visionaries of the Titanic when they declared not even God could sink this ship. Regardless of the taunts, this field commander gave, the men of Hezekiah and Hezekiah himself sought God. Notice what Hezekiah did here. He went to God, humbly, contrite. When they tear their clothes, that was a symbol of of deep humility and, and, and crying out to God. And he cried out. He says, I know you're God and you're Lord. I need your help. He knew his limitations. He knew he was weak. But in his God, he is strong. When you know your limitations, when you recognize your need, when you recognize your need, you call out to the one who is faithful to meet your needs. He is the one who will never leave us nor forsake us. Call on Christ as we live in this evil age that taunts the living God, that laughs at the resurrection and ridicules the cross. Call on God so that we will love these people with the love that God has for them. And give them the gospel regardless of how they may treat us. Let us rely on him. Know that you're saved and in his presence, his presence is real. And that he does love you. So as we live in this evil age, as we walk the path of skepticism may close in on us, we fight it with our faith in God and our love for each other and for those around us. Know that when you're weak, you're made strong. And number three, the weaker we are, the greater the power is known. Let's look at 14, verse 14 of chapter 37. Hezekiah received the letter. This is another letter from uh, the, the field commander. It says, Hezekiah received the letter from the messenger and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to all the words Sennacherib has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste all these people in their lands. They have thrown their gods into fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Then if you would jump to verse 36 of chapter 37. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up in the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Adromelech and Sharzer cut him down with a sword and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Esar Hayden, his son, succeeded him as king. Maybe you today here are struggling with the difficulties maybe that you're facing. Maybe you're addicted and cannot stop. You're dealing with financial issues and you can't see a way out. Maybe you're struggling with, a, with belief in this age of skepticism. As, this, as skepticism rages war against your faith. You look to God, he seems distant and far away. Maybe you're struggling with relationship issues, a chronic illness, debilitating pain, pride, anger, insecurity, fear, identity crisis, trauma, etc., etc., etc. In this life, you're bound to get hurt. Look at what Hezekiah did, though. Look at how he handled this fearful situation. He acknowledged who God is. He looked to the character of God. Number one there, reflect on God's character. Every day we should do this. Hezekiah began with worship. 
he laid that letter out and he looked to God and he began to speak the truth of who God is. Regardless of your situation, depression, frustration, speak the truth of God. Know his character. When you look to God, you see him and you worship. You declare his nature and character and through him you have peace. You lay before him and say, God, this is who you are. You are holy. You're faithful. You're true. You're loving. You're mighty. Nothing can overcome you. You are omniscient. You're omnipotent. You're mighty. As you reflect on his character and you look at life and the problems and the struggles you're having in the light of his character, you see that he can overcome it. When Hezekiah reflected on God's character, he could then understand the problem in light of God's nature. The Assyrian army didn't look so big after all. And notice he says in verse 20 of chapter 37. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone, O Lord, are God. When you look at God's character and the nature of what you're facing, you then seek for God to be made known through you as you go through it, as you overcome it, as you walk past it. And you see the power of God reflected in you and people will see God and say, what God is that? Now turn with me to verse uh, 30, chapter 31, verses 8 and 9. And we see that Assyria was already defeated long before they ever came to Jerusalem. <laughs> In Isaiah 31, verse 8, it says, Assyria will fall by a sword that is not of man. A sword not of mortals will devour them. They will flee before the sword, and their young men will be put for, to forced labor. Their stronghold will fall because of terror. At the sight of the battle stand, their commanders will panic declares the Lord, whose fire is in Jerusalem, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. They were defeated before they even came to Jerusalem because God had ordained it. You know, God wanted, needed them, or need them, he called them to take out Israel for their idolatry, that those two gods that would not ever be removed. So he says, okay, they're done. And he exiled them. Then they got cocky. Then they got arrogant. And so they were defeated. When you're weak, you're made strong. When you're humble, you're lifted up. When you realize the sin in your heart and you go to God, he pours his righteousness in you and you're made right with him. When you recognize, when you see Christ on the cross, say that sin was my sin on him that made him die. You fall before him and say, God, I got nothing. I need you. And he pours his self into you. Reflect on his character as you face the struggles of life. Secondly, watch God provide. Let's look again at um, 37, um, 28 and 29. 37, 28 and 29. It says, but I know where you stay and when you come and go and how you rage against me. This is God speaking to Syrian officers. Because you rage against me and because your insolence has reached my ears, I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth, and I will make you return by the way you came. Assyria was ordained, certainly by God, to exile Israel. But again, they got prideful. And instead, what do you see? An angel of the Lord wipes out 185,000 soldiers. In the ancient world, when an army would come in to attack a city, and every city would have a wall, they would either do one of two things. Either they would, number one, they would build a siege ramp, and then they would put their army up there, and then they would go in and take over the city. Of course, they'd lose a lot of people. Or second, they would simply wait by the wall until the food of the city ran out. They would simply camp out by the city and just wait and wait. And so they would wait until the city ran out of food, and then the people would come out starving and dying, and then they would take over the city. And this is what it looks like Assyria was going to do. They were simply going to wait. Well, the Assyrian army did not have a chance because God settled the matter rather quickly. And the army was defeated not because Judah had a stronger army. The Assyrians were defeated because they had a better God, the true and living God. They didn't have bigger technology or more advanced weaponry. They didn't have neighbors coming in to help them. The Assyrians were defeated because God is Lord and these are his people. 
Sennacherib, when he saw all those dead bodies, he left. He had nothing to say. He had nothing to do. He had no army to, to, to use, to advance with. He simply went home to his own demise. Judah was weak and its army was worse. They really had no way of defending themselves. The weaker they were, de- they were demonstrated even in a greater way the power of God's mercy and grace. Should Judah live under the thumb of an army so that God's power may increase? May it never be, for if God saved us from the oppression of that siege, why should we live in it any longer? (laughs) As we celebrate this Christmas season, as we gaze at the baby in the manger, we realize we're saved from our sins. We have been given righteousness. When you reflect on God's nature and realize this is who God is, this is the God I worship. And you see your life in light of the character and nature of God. You go, that army don't seem so big anymore. Because when you're weak in Christ, you're made strong. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that no issue, no problem can stand a chance in your presence. And Lord, I know there may be many here that may be struggling with whatever is happening in their lives. But I pray, Lord, that your character, your beauty, your might would help them to see your provision, your sustenance, your love, your grace. Oh, Lord, I just pray your grace would fall upon us, your spirit would fall upon us. That, Lord, we'd put aside all of the things we think make us good and strong. And we just throw them away and say, it's all rubbish, Lord, for in you I am strong. Oh, Lord, I pray that we would do that. And just hold on to you dearly. And love you wholly.